Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody who is joining us today and welcome to the second day of the CreateDB workshop. Yesterday, we had a very interesting topics uh, covered by great speakers and we mostly covered some of the fundamental things about CreateDB. Today, uh, we are moving to more advanced modules. But before we start, I would like to introduce you our hosts. So my name is Maria Selakovic. I work as a developer advocate at CreateDB, and I have a great pleasure to introduce you to Karin, who is our solution engineer at CreateDB, and Marius, who is working as a senior software engineer at CreateDB. Now let's take a look into our agenda for today. As I said, today's topics are going to be more advanced compared to yesterday. And we will have today only two modules. Uh, in the module four, uh, if you remember yesterday, we had three modules. The next one, module four, is going to be about modeling data in CreateDB. And in this module, you are going to learn a lot about data types in CreateDB, about full text search, about sharding and partitioning, and some good uh, practices when actually designing the CreateDB cluster. Then we will make a break of a couple of minutes before module four and module five, and then uh, we will move to the topic about query planning and optimizations. In this module presented by Marius, you will learn how to optimize your queries, how to analyze the execution plans, and Marius is going to share some very good tips and tricks um, about query optimizations. Finally, we will move to the Q&A, but I would like to mention that at the end of each module, we will have a short Q&A session. And if there are some questions that we don't manage to answer during the time for each module, we will uh, actually leave them at the end of the Q&A. Um, we plan uh, for today's um, workshop to last about two hours. But if there is a need uh, to cover more questions or you would like to share with us um, more, more feedback or you would like to ask more about KDB, don't worry, we can, we can facilitate this at the very end. So we are starting around 2 p.m. Central European time. Uh, the plan is to be finished by 4 p.m. Central European time with a one small break between the modules. So this is how the organization is going to look like today. And I would like now to uh, give a stage to my colleague, Karin, and to welcome her today. Hi, Karin. Hi, Maria. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for presenting uh, the modules that are, we're going to cover today. So hello, everyone. This is Karin here. I'm a solution engineer at Crate, and I'm pleased to share more on modeling data in pray to be So before we head into the topics that we're going to discuss today, I'd like to cover the housekeeping rules for this session. So first, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to send them using the Q&A function in Zoom. You can find it, I think, on the lower part of your screen. So feel free to send your messages. If you want, you can also send them uh, uh, as anonymous. Uh, it will be answered, as Maria already said. The questions will be answered uh, at the end of the module. And once we're finished with, uh, with this first module, we'll have a, small, a short break. And then uh, we will resume with the next uh, module by Marius. Finally, this session, you may have uh, noticed by now, this session is being recorded and will be shared after all, after that, okay? Great. So now that we're all good with the rules, let's go to the agenda for this module right here. So first, we're going to discuss a little bit on the data types available on Create2B. And based on that, we can then do the you know, make the best decisions when modeling our table. After that, a bit on indexing in CreateDB, which is quite relevant when we're talking about performance there. Third, we will have, uh, we will cover the full text search topic. That's quite interesting as well. I'm a bit suspicious. I do love all, everything that I'm going to be talking today. 
but this one is really interesting as well. And last but definitely not least, this is really relevant for you to understand the bits and bytes of Create to Be, sharding and partitioning. So you have to understand that to really make the best decisions when, uh, when defining your table. Okay, so let's get started. First, choosing the right data type. Well, this is really relevant, as I said, when you're starting with Create to Be, it's really important for you to understand what exactly, uh, what are the data types that I'm going to choose for my table? Well, given that I have this scenario, this use case, what should I choose? Well, even before that, I would invite you to step back and learn a bit more on the data types that are available in Create to Be. So let's see them. Well, you can see here, uh, the groups of data types and the corresponding types in each group. If you already have some experience uh, with SQL or other uh, database solutions, you may recognize most data types presented here, okay? Uh, so let's say, I will just use one example to explain more about the, the data types here. So let's say you want to create an inventory table. Uh, one of the columns can be number of items, for instance. So you should consider, you know, based on those groups that you see there, well, you should consider the numeric group, right? Because you're counting elements. But, well, which one to choose, right? Well, it depends on the constraints you have in place. For instance, we know the number of item column will count elements, as I said. So it will not use decimal numbers. So maybe that does not make sense. So maybe you should consider integers then. But then integers might be interesting, but there is also an option to, for, to choose small ints, but they are a bit too restrictive range-wise because it goes from negative 32,000 around there to positive 32,000. So that can be quite limiting. So integer sounds better. Than, than small int. So this type of uh, things you should have in mind and you should really consider when you're defining your table schema, okay? Great. So what I want you to, to understand is that the data types that I have here, they are the ones that are supported by create to be but there are other types supported. However, they are only supported as type literals, such as JSON, uh, interval, numeric, time, date. They can be used in SQL expressions like typecast because of you know compatibility. Um, we're ensuring compatibility there. Okay, so you have an idea already. I think that the scalar data types they are quite straightforward. So we're moving a bit away from that, and we're going to discuss more about objects. Okay, so objects, what are these beautiful things? Well, they are part of the container type, as you saw previously. They are structured as a collection of key value, right? As you can see here, we have a couple of uh, objects there. And you may see some similarities with JSON objects, okay? So what are the pol column policy policies available? Well, there are three, dynamic, strict, or ignored. When defining a, a, an object, the column policy, policy is not required, okay? However, if you don't define, as you can see here, the first one, and we're going to cover that right now. If you don't define, well, it defaults to dynamic, okay? So in this case here, as you can see, the object, it does not have the definition of the column policy there. So it defaults to dynamic. So what is important for you to understand about the dynamic object? Well, the list of subcolumns is not required up front, which is the case here. You can see I just defined this column, but I haven't defined anything beyond that. So it's not mandatory up front. It will be created. So the schema will be defined as you insert new records. Okay, so new subcolumns, they are added to the column definition, of course, at any time with new inserts. In this case here, we have this insert that 
refers to words as one of the columns and length as, well, as another column. So once you run this insert, you see that the, the column definition will be changed to those two words there, and the data types will be inferred from the insert. Okay, sounds great. However, it's really important. We, uh, the object provides this uh, flexibility, but you should be aware that if you try to, once you inserted this, for instance, and you try to, after that, run another insert with the same uh, column name, but with a different data type, like a text, well, that's not a good idea because you cannot overwrite the data type that was previously created, okay? So make sure you keep in mind, you've already added that, that, that column, it will be on the, on the object definition, so you should comply with that. Great, so that's the dynamic, let's move on to the strict. Well, the three column policy, it's less flexible than the, than the dynamic, of course. Uh, so it requires the object to conform to the subcolumn list. So in this case, you see already, we have age and first name as integer and text, and it is already defined uh, inside this object, right? So if you try to insert a new record with uh, an extra column here, it will not work. So we will give an error and you will not have this new record inserted. Okay, there is an option. You saw that previously we defined the dynamic object with no subcolumns inside. And as you insert, new, new subcolumns will be defined. However, if you define an object straight empty, it makes no sense because you only have an unusable column that will always be no. So be careful when you're playing with the objects there. So you make sure to really have the, the column policy defined. Last but not least, we have ignored. Well, both ignored and dynamic don't need to comply with the defined schema meaning that if you need more flexibility to design your table schema, they are definitely the way to go. However, the ignored object does not update the object schema at inserts containing previously not defined column, okay? Meaning it will be stored on the table regardless, but on a different structure, in a different way. So if you check your uh, like show create table, uh, statement on, on the table that you just created and you inserted a set of new sub columns to the object ignored, you will not see the newly uh, added columns there, okay? Only the ones that were previously defined. Great, there are further differences between um, ignored and dynamic, but I'll cover that in a second on the, on the next um, topic but I want you to understand that they are both quite uh, they are both quite flexible and that's quite useful depending on the way that you're planning to use them. It's something that you should take in mind. Something that I almost forgot to mention is that the same thing that I explained for dynamic is applicable here. So if you try to, for instance, you defined um, a column, a sub column for this object with a given data type, and you try to insert that same column name, but with a different data type, it will not work. Okay, great. So let's move to the next topic. But before, I just wanted to, to do a quick parenthesis here before wrapping up this part of the objects, which is, so I know objects may seem a bit complex, but it is quite easy to query them. So simply by using, as you can see here on this example, simply by using the key to a given value, you see here age, you can access the value for that subcolumn. So if you're unsure whether you know objects they they are relevant for your uh, table schema, you should consider. You know you you may be afraid. Oh my God, is it too difficult? No, actually that's pretty straightforward, and you. Maybe that's something that you should consider for your data type, for your uh, table definition. But then what should I consider when choosing the data type? And that's something that I really want to discuss with you. So there are three major uh, things that I, I think you should consider. So first use, you should always ask yourself, is the variable in question stored only for compliance reasons 
or do I expect it to be queried and the data to be filtered by it or to use some aggregation functions? How am I going to use that column? So that I think that's the first uh, question we may have in mind before defining any, uh, any data type. For instance, let's say if you have a, a certain column for compliance only, you could choose text, simple as that as a data type, and it would be enough to simply store the value of the column and you're good, you have the data there, all good. But if you want to use aggregation functions on that column, a numeric data type would be a better fit, right? So you should have that in consideration, the use. Second, storage. So is storage a concern? By choosing the right data type, you can save Thompson storage for sure, and the Opposite is quite true as well. If you choose it wrong, well, you can waste a lot of storage unnecessarily. So for example, as previously mentioned, small wind might be too restrictive range-wise since it goes from around negative 32,000 to positive 32,000, but it is only two bytes width. So depending on the case, if it makes sense to choose it instead of integer, well, integer is double that size. So that's something you should have in mind, of course. Um, there is also a more complex uh, example that I want to share with you, which is, there you go. What is that? So this is a time series data example that instead of storing every reading, for instance, of a, a given uh, sensor, instead of storing every reading on a new record, on a new row, you can, dial, for instance, on a DAO sampling effort, or I don't know exactly, there are many possibilities there, but basically instead of having one row for each new record, you can have one row with an array and each position of the array stores a different hour for that, uh, for that ID, uh, that sensor ID. This is a, pretty straightforward example, but you can see here, there are these two rows referring to the sensor ID one with these readings here. They are referring to different hours there of the same day. Instead of having these two rows, you can have only one row that contains the first hour and the second hour reading in an array instead. So that's something that you should really consider when talking about storage. Finally, if you're looking to represent your data in a more structured way, you should consider objects and variations like objects with objects and all that uh, interesting possibilities. They are flexible enough to be used to model your data. And as you saw previously, they are also easy to query. Okay, so that's something that I also um, would say that it's quite interesting for you to consider. Okay. Now we understand that, that, that there are differences between you know, the different data types and what you should consider. That's quite interesting. Uh, so let's talk about indexing, okay? Okay, indexing, great. Let's have an overview on that. Well, by now you may know, you may have heard that everything is indexed in CreateDB. But how is that really? So just a quick overview here. Well, everything's indexed. Uh, how should you understand that? So again, step back. First, create to be uses Lucene as storage engine. Okay. That's really interesting because it leverages the inverted index, blocky D trees, and all those strategies that are uh, indexing strategies that are quite performant when storing your data and querying your data. Besides that, it's, uh, it, is, it uses uh, a lot of interesting indexing uh, strategies that I'll share uh, following. So let's dive in and understand a bit more what we're talking about here, okay? So there are two different strategies that I mentioned before. This is the indexing for text values and the other is for numeric values, right? 
So starting with this, well, actually I'll have an entire uh, topic, uh, a following topic that will cover that. So I will not spend much time here, but I want you to retain that there is an option in Create a Bit to efficiently index text values. As you can see here, um, I love this topic, honestly. So we'll be quiet. I will just give a quick overview before we move uh, before we talk on the next uh, point. But here, basically, the idea is that if you insert text value, you will you won't need to to go through the to go through the each row looking for a text when you're querying the data. You can use this inverted index element that will allow you to go straight to the terms that you're looking for and identify which are the records that are relevant to that. Meaning, create a B will transform this into this, so it makes things more efficient. How does it transform? You'll see in a second. But before, let's talk more about the indexing for numeric value. Well, this is a bit more complex topic, so I will not be covering the bits and bytes of Bakey trees. All you need to know, is that this is really optimized to retrieve numeric values. Uh, and given a range of a specific numbers, that's quite uh, interesting to see how it works. So if you're interested in really diving deep into those two, th this strategy, I do recommend you to uh, search on, I think Maria wrote one blog post that was quite interesting, I think, we're, and we're going to share the link afterwards. So I do recommend you to have a look it's quite interesting, but uh, I don't think it is for the scope of this presentation right now, but I want you to retain that this is really performant and you should understand that's what's behind um, our numeric values, okay? So again, we talked about some data types, how they're indexed, but what about objects? I know the fun part. So again, it is a bit different for the, for the three uh, column uh, column policies, okay? So we're starting with the dynamic, same example as before, okay, everyone? So we're going to go through each of those. So first, you can see here, this is a dynamic object and everything is indexed. So every new column that you add to that object will get indexed. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. I know not much detail there, but basically that's how it works, okay? So you will get your data indexed whenever if you're adding new columns and new columns, it will be indexed. Now it's strict, same thing, everything is indexed. Well, this is a bit less uh, exciting, I know, because since you have defined the columns there already, they are going to be indexed just like, you know, uh, regular columns outside of objects. That's the same thing there. So it will be indexed all good. Now, ignored, that's quite interesting. So the columns that were defined already on the on the column, the column list for that object, they are indexed. But whatever new columns that you add, well, they will not get indexed. Okay, so that's the difference I mentioned for you. I mentioned here already that dynamic and ignored, they have a couple of differences there. The first was referring to the new columns, how they get, if they get inserted to the to the column list or not, but also they have differences when it comes to indexing. Great, that's great. Okay, so now you understand how this indexing looks like, but how can we really configure them? So there are these two configurations when it comes to indexing, and the first one is index off, you can apply that, but really be careful with this because you cannot change that once a table is created and populated. Okay, so you cannot simply start indexing data once you already have populated your column that had index off. So that's not how you should do. So that's why I, I urge you to really be careful with this. And now the column store, that's quite interesting because you can choose to turn off the column store for the call for that specific column. One data type that cannot be used, that cannot uh, apply that is the geotypes. So you cannot turn off the column store in that case, okay? And that's it for how you can configure. 
However, I know we haven't discussed yet partitions and sharding, but I want you to keep in mind that these both configurations, they cannot be used, cannot be used for the parti partition columns. We're going to talk about that later, but I really want you to keep that in mind, okay? So you make sure that you safely configure your table. Great. Before I move to the next, I just want you to remember to post any of your questions on the Q&A. Feel free if you already find any, you know, any questions in your head, feel free to add them to the Q&A. Okay, so let's move to the fun part. Full text search in Create2B. Okay, last, uh, last time we, we had a previous workshop and I already covered that, but it was way less uh, in depth. This time we're going to cover, give more details on that, okay? So, when to consider full text search? Well, full text search, so the name. You're looking for, uh, you're going to search on a text. So if you have a lot of uh, text data, and you have to perform um, queries on those texts on a, the best performance way, well, maybe you should consider full text search, okay? Uh, I just mentioned efficiency. If that's important, again, you should consider. Uh, you do need, uh, you know, a bit of a powerful full text queries. For instance, oh, for me, it is important to consider the, the ordering of the words, so in my queries, that's something relevant. Well, then again, you should consider full text search. So that's a quite interesting feature in, in Create2B. And I think you, you really should listen to this, uh, this section right here. Okay, so let's understand a bit more. How does that work in Create2B? Okay. I said a little bit previously, what happened when you inserted the when you inserted text on Create2B and how it got transformed into the inverted index. But let me present to you a bit in more detail here. So you can see here, we have these two rows. So basically let's say this is a table that has only ID and content as columns and the content, of course, it is, it's a text. So you have there, as, you know, some uh, terms and what happens when you have your uh, full text search, your full text uh, indexing uh, enabled? Well, once you insert new records into Create2B, it will go through an analyzer, which has several inner steps there. These are the three, not several, three, sorry, uh, uh, elements there. It always have to have a tokenizer, I'll explain how they work later, but it always has to have a tokenizer. It can have token filters or char filters, char filters, okay? So it goes through an analyzer that will break down the elements, remove anything that is unwanted, and then put together, you know, where what are the occurrences of the term? So in this case, we see that brown, brown is containing both document one and document two. We have it here. So dog same, fox same, jump same, and so on. Some are only on two and leap only on two as well. So basically what's the idea there? If you're searching for a term or an expression, instead of going through every record looking, okay, the, that's not what we're looking for, quick, brown, that's not what we're looking for. Oh, let me go to the next one, quick, brown, oh, that's not what we're looking for. You go straight to the inverted index, oopsie, Sorry, you go straight to the inverted index and you search for the terms that are relevant for you. Okay, so in this case, okay, brown is relevant. So I know that both documents, they contain that, that term. Does that make sense? Is it clear how uh, faster this is than the, the other strategy? Okay, so moving on, now I'm going to explain a bit more on the analyzer. So, Basically, you can define, you know, when you want your uh, text column to use a full text uh, analyzer, the standard analyzer, sorry, you should define it like this. Otherwise, you know, by default, actually, it will be just like that and you, you won't have that supporting inverted index 
to help with the performance of your queries, okay? Important to know that the analyzer, as I said, there it's composed of those three elements there, and they are highly, com highly configurable, but they're also uh, built-in analyzers that you can choose from. But let's first understand how the standard analyzer works. Okay, so as I said, let's imagine here one example. So uh, create, create a B just receives these, uh, your, your, sorry, your cluster just got this new text inserted and you want to get to the, to this last step here. So how does that work? So the first step is a tokenizer. What does it do? Depending on a criteria, it will divide your text into smaller pieces. In this case, for the standard analyzer, it is the white space, okay? But you can, there are other options there. Again, I advise you to check the documentation. Once you have defined that, you can choose the token filter, which will, well, define which tokens they are not relevant for your search. In this case, like the is not really something that we should consider because it's quite common. So that's not something that you, we usually search for. So you can remove that. So we call that removing stop words, for instance. And there you go, the over and the other, the, they were removed, resulting in these terms. Finally, if we're going to the char filter, well, you can see up there that we have lazy with a couple of capital letters and doc all cap, uh, capital letters. And the char filter will transform that. So you have it here. It's a bit different. You see the A is normal and the dog is normal. Why is that? Because, you know, typos, they can, the, sorry, not typos, but like the upper and lowercase letters, they can be quite uh, misleading when you're searching for the word because lazy with an upper A can, uh, does mean actually the same as lazy with uh, all lower cases. So, you know, this kind of uh, transformation is really important when we are dealing with uh, the data before the indexing, okay? Does that make sense? So let me go over with you again on the standard analyzer. So this is how it looks here. If you want to create a text analyzer, and this is how you, it looks again, feel free to check the documentation. You might, uh, we might already have a built-in analyzer that fits your use case, but you can check it here. Okay, so tokenizer white space, as I said, this is where it splits the text at using the white space as the, the rule. That's what you saw previously. For the token filter, we have the lowercase, so normalizes the text to lowercase. And char filter, this is a quite interesting one because for those who are more interested in uh, natural language processing, there are two, well, there are many actually strategies for that, but this is something that is similar to uh, lemmatization and steaming where you can, I hope I said it right, where you can basically change, replace some of the, the charts here and there to make sure that similar words, they are mapped as the same thing. For instance, when we flex reads, when we're talking about he, she, eat, it should have the same uh, understanding as read when it's not flex for I, you, well, I, you, they, I, you, we, and they, right? So for instance, I can remove the last S and the read should be the same for everyone regardless, right? So this type of uh, char filter is quite interesting because you can replace characters. That's what I was trying to say. Maybe I was a bit confusing. So in this case here, for instance, you can replace the uh, PH for F and Q, U for Q. And that's the mapping you can create yourself and creating your own text analyzer. Okay, so just a recap, these are all the configurations available there. And again, I know I've been repeating that a lot, but feel free to check the full list of building analyzers, okay? This is quite interesting. I do recommend you have a look at that. Okay, so that sounds all great. Uh, that's quite interesting but how can I really use the, this index that I just created that's way more powerful? Well, you can use the match function. So for the match function, 
use simply. Well, the use may sound quite similar to the like. However, the like perform a search on each row, not using the supporting uh, the supporting structure that we just created. So the like is not as performant as the match. Okay, and the match will use this interesting structure that we mentioned. In this case, you can see as an example, we have this table documents with ID and content, which was the one that we just used previously on the examples. And you can see here that I'm matching the content on Apple. So I'm looking for the Apple term on the inverted index, right? What will that do? Well, it will return the rows from the document that contain the word Apple. Pretty straightforward, right? But of course, we're not uh, limited to that because there is another thing that I find quite interesting when it comes to match. What is that? Is the score. So to get a bit more insight into the results that you, you got from the query, from the, the match level, we can say, to the, to the query that I, that I ran, there is the score value. And what's, what does that mean? Well, it's based on a Lucene scoring and it involves several factors, but you can think as something like a distance of that um, of that term that I searched, the distance from the text that I have, for instance. Okay, so this score it can be um, quite interesting for you to evaluate. However, it's really important for you to not compare results got from one query to a completely different one. This score cannot be compared between, sorry, it cannot be compared between those results. Why that? Because it really depends on the results that you got for that query, okay? So they are not comparable. Great. So let's move on to the next uh, slide. I know you got a bit of a spoil spoiler there. But we do have also an option to define match types. So this far, I was talking more about the, the basic, which is the best fields. But there is also other options that you can also find. Um, you can also find, find in our documentation. But basically, I just wanted to give you an example of a different one, which is the phrase. Well, this uh, phrase match takes into consideration the order of the query term and the searched columns, okay? So for instance, apple tree, it will take into consideration that apple comes before tree and we will search for that. And the score will be calculated based on the order as well, okay? So that's one thing that I, I don't know, I find it interesting. Maybe I'm too nerd for that, but I really find it interesting uh, how this is uh, quite flexible and how those uh, searches, they can be really, how can I say? They can be a good match and there are so many options that can really match a lot of use cases. Okay, last but not least, I'm almost done with this part, everyone. This is search on multiple columns. There is also that option. So as you saw previously, so far I was just matching one column to a couple of terms, one term, whatever, but here you can also do like match. You can see here on the example, you have the match name and description. I want you to look, search for both this term on both this term. So I'm looking for galaxy on both name and description, okay? So I do recommend you have a look at those options there. I think it's quite interesting. You can, uh, you can check the documentation if you have any questions. And sure, we can support you anytime. Now, I know I, I created a bit of a, a, a bit of a uh, hype for this, but I really want to talk about sharding and partitioning, how important that is for creativity. So we spend a bit more time maybe on this. I don't know how much more time I have here. Uh, so I will share a bit more on this because I really find this fundamental to understand create B. And this is really a core concept. So I hope uh, you're still with me there and we will go over the details. So what is sharding and partitioning? So I bet some of you have already 
used it. Maybe some of you used it and had no idea that you were, you were using it because we do have some default configurations for that. But basically the idea of sharding and partition is the follow. So every table that you create, they can, can be split into partitions. Okay, that's something that you, that you have to configure. It can be uh, split into partitions, which is basically, if you, if you think of that, it's basically like a smaller uh, table, okay? And each partition, I would say a smaller table with a subset of the, of the, of the records on, on your main table, okay? And then each partition will, have, will be composed of shards. So these are smaller parts in the, the partition. And next, you have segments. Okay, so charts are composed of segments. But we're not going to cover that in this session. So I just want you to understand like this hierarchy going on here. So first, the table is the biggest part. Then we have partitions. And then we have charts within the, the partitions. Okay. Sounds great, but how does that look when we're talking about the create table statement? Well, when talking about creating table statement, you choose which column will be used to define the partitions, right? You can choose here, you see here. In this case, it's month. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Hernan mentioned yesterday about the generated columns, and this is one example how we can uh, apply that. So based on another column here, timestamp, we extract the, ref uh, the referred month on a generated column, and that will be used to partition that table. So as you can see here on the example, May and June, so this table contains information about May and June, and each partition will refer one to May, May and the other to June. Okay? So this is quite interesting. And you understand a bit later why that's so interesting when querying the data. But basically, that's the idea. Partition, you can choose uh, a column that will define how the data will get divided into these smaller tables. OK. So and sharding, how does that look like? So partition, OK, you, define, you, you get a column. Oh, and that's really important. Something that I mentioned before. I don't know if you st you're still remember. But do you remember the configurations that cannot be applied to the partition uh, column? Well, that's the partition column that you should never turn off the index or the column star. OK, so keep that in mind. Now you know what, what I meant by the partition column. Great. Now about sharding. Uh, about sharding. Well, that's the next step. Once you define the partition, in case you, you need it, you have to define the number of shards. So here we chose three shards, as you can see here. And it is important to say, that's a really important detail, that with more shards, more parallel power you may achieve, since the shards can run the queries in parallel. However, with more shards, you can also have more overhead. So you should be careful when choosing the right number of shards for your use case. Another thing that is uh, important for me to mention here, the shards, so we're talking about a cl cluster here, right? So the number of shards should be compatible with the number of nodes in your cluster. So for instance, if you have three clusters, three <laughs> nodes in your cluster, you should consider, you know, multiples of three for your shard. You can be three, six, nine, so on, okay? In this case, for May, again, May, I define a three shard. So each partition will have three shards, as you can see here. Uh, great. So, but how does that really work, you know, partition-wise, shard-wise? Well, this is all managed by create to be so it's transparent for you as an end user. So for instance, let's say May, June is gone and tomorrow is 1st of July. Well, tomorrow the system will make sure to uh, instantiate this new partition and redirect the, the new inserted data to there when it comes to the defined partition column. So anything that matches the partition column defined here, it will go here, okay? Sounds great, but how that 
you know, that's for the partitions. Sounds good. So each partition has a shard. So how is the data distributed between the shards among the shards? Oopsie. Okay, so basically, CreateDB calculates the distribution of data based on a hash function, which uses a routing column. Okay, by default, that routing column is an internal ID. You can see this ID here. But you can set your own routing column when defining the table. And also, if you define a primary key, the routing can also, uh, the routing will use that primary key. Okay, with these, I think we covered the fundamentals of partition and sharding, so you have a better understanding of that. But how does this relate to high availability, for instance? How can we achieve that? So, replicas. Well, we know that each table is split into shards and the shards are distributed among the nodes of a cluster. But uh, in this case, the table is clustered into three shards, right? So each partition has three shards, as I said previously. One shard is on each uh, on each node there, which is evenly distributed. So well done, looks great. But well, what if one node is lost? What if it stops responding for some unknown reason? Well, would the data be lost? How can we try to avoid that? Well, replicas is the answer for you. Basically, the idea is that you are going to have uh, to configure that. In this case, please keep in mind, now I changed the example. Previously, it was two months there. Now I'm referring to the primary shard and the replica. OK? So Hernan, Hernan explained yeah, uh, last session about the number of replica, this configuration here. And I want to illustrate how that looks in real life. So this one parameter can be configured as he covered already, number of replicas. And it allows you to define how many copies of your shards will be in the cluster. When there are multiple copies of the same shard, CreateDB will mark one as the primary and treat the rest as replica shards. Write operations always go to the primary shard whereas read operations can go to any shard. CreateDB continually synchronizes data from primary to all replicas for a process known as shard recovery, just so you, so you know the logic, so you understand they are in sync. So when a primary shard is lost, as the example I said before, CreateDB will promote a replica to a primary, so we'll make sure the data is safe. This is the same reasoning when considering the number of shards. So more replicas mean a smaller chance of permanent data loss for increased data redundancy in exchange for more disk space utilization and intra-cluster network traffic. So that's something you, you should have in mind. Of course, you want to make sure the high availability is there, but you should also take that into consideration in your math. OK, replication can also improve read performance. But again, same thing. We have uh, more shards distributed across the cluster, which also creates more possibilities for CreateDB to parallelize per execution across multiple nodes. So that's what I want you to retain from this session here. So partitioning is quite interesting when you are configuring that, because this can help you when querying data. And Yes, this is for the next module, and I do recommend you stay for the next module because you're going to have a better understanding on how querying data on CreateDB really works and how you can make uh, your queries more efficient, okay? So that's all for my talk. I know I talked a little bit <laughs> too much, but let's see if I can uh, answer any of, your, uh, any of your questions. Okay, so I see there are some questions here. Uh, okay, so is it useful to use full text analyzer when you search for part of the strings, substrings as few shards from harsh uh, hashed identifiers? Well, before that, I think it's important to mention that 
in that case, if you use the analyzer that I showed with you, the, the standard analyzer, it will not work for that case because the standard analyzer is, um, I would say, indicated for like text, human text, because it will split uh, things on, we split things on uh, white spaces and things like that. So I don't think it's the recommendation there. But if you have some kind of, uh, we can say, standard on how to divide those substrings, you can consider that uh, creating your own analyzer based on those um, patterns that you can divide those substrings. Does that make sense? Uh, if I, Sorry, I forgot to say that if my colleagues here, they want to add more to my answers, feel free, jumping anytime, okay? Okay, oh my God, I have so many questions. Just one second. <laughs> so what are the best practices when using sharding and partitioning columns? Well, this is something that I believe Marius will cover in more detail. But one thing that I do recommend to you when considering sharding and partitioning uh, strategies is first, Please think about uh, the, the number of shards that you have on your cluster because we do have a uh, limitation, not limitation, we do enforce that there should not be more than 1,000 uh, shards per node in your cluster. So, so that's something that you should always have uh, in consideration, you know, given the, the overhead that you may have on your cluster. So we do have that limitation in place. So that's one thing that you should consider when defining your strategy. Uh, also, we're talking about query performance and that's something that Marius will explain on the next module. And I, again, keep tuned because that's quite interesting. Uh, so you should consider your querying uh, behavior. So are you querying for a specific time frames uh, that make sense for you to define as partitions because this way you are going to ensure that you're queries, they do not hit the entire data set, but only the relevant uh, shards. But again, Marius will explain that better on the next, uh, on the next uh, topic. I think Maria, uh, and is, does anyone want to answer more on the, on the best practices there? Okay. Uh, can I disable doc values? So as I showed previously how you can uh, define the, um, how you can define the, the indexing there, there are a couple, uh, there are the option for you to enable and enable and disable the, the, the options there. So both the index and the column store, they are there, there are those two options, but keep in mind the gel, uh, geo types, they are not, they are currently not supported for the column store uh, configuration there, okay? So it will be always on. Okay, let me answer this one. Oopsie. Sorry, uh, I missed yeah. one about the, the doc values, right? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The, the doc values is the column store off, so. Yeah. Same thing, yeah. Sorry. Because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, th thank you. Thank you for that. I was just go giving a bit more uh, broad understanding. But yeah, the yeah. doc value is the column store. And as I said, the geotypes, they are not. Uh, yeah, thank you. you. I, got, I got also <laughs> distracted for a moment. So I wasn't no sure. Worries. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but thank you for jumping in, really. Okay. Uh, what action is taken when a read replica is lost? Okay. So basically, this is something that you don't have to you as like the, the end user, you don't have to manage. The cluster itself will heal. And in this case, the heal means more to the node loss. But what I mean is it will uh, make sure that it, it will comply with the ruling place. So for instance, if you have the number of re replica equals one, meaning for each primary, uh, primary shard, you should have a corresponding uh, replica shard the system will make sure to, if it get lost, it will make sure to uh, create a new one, okay? Because of the rule that you have for your table. So keep in mind, this is a rule level uh, configuration that you have. 
table level, sorry, configuration that you have. So in this case, if this is a replica for that specific table that is defined, it requires one replica to be available, it will then recreate that. Okay. And sorry, just to add uh, here for the query itself that the query doesn't fail. So if there is a, an operation on the SART that it's currently lost because the node went down, the, uh, the planner of execution engine will understand that and re-execute the query on the replica SART that becomes available now as a primary during the recovery. Great, so thank you. So you don't even experience a, a query that uh, it's broken and you need to rerun it. Yeah, exactly. As I, I think I mentioned that previously. So for the read queries, we do run them in parallel uh, through the shards, like replicas or non-replicas. So yeah, you can uh, make sure the data, the data will certainly be returned for you. Okay, I see more questions there. So let me continue. And of course, if we are not able to answer them all right now, we still have a Q&A by the end of uh, the fifth module. Okay, so how is loss of a primary detected and how fast is this? So I don't have the details on the bits and bytes on how it is detected, but again, this is transparent to the end user, so you don't have to do some man something manually. As I said, if the primary is lost, then the replica will be promoted to be a primary uh, shard, and from now on, that will be the primary, and the system will create the will create the the missing um, replica shard, okay? I don't know if uh, any of you want to add more to that. Okay. Oh, that's a good one. Partitioning reduces time responses of queries. Actually, no, no. Uh, and that's again, Marius will cover that on the next uh, on the next module. But basically, the idea is that when you partition your table, when you partition your table, uh, let's say when we're talking about uh, time-based partitioning, you will have a subset of data that's specific to a given month, for instance, let's say, as the example that I provided previously. So whenever you query your data based on month, you will not need to go through, you know, go through all the shards, you will not have to to send the query to all the shards, it will only send the, the query to the relevant shards of related to that partition. So it does not, oh, it reduces time, sorry. <laughs> it, yeah, it's more performant. I thought like reducing time, it's worse. No, 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 sorry. It's more performant. Of course it does uh, reduce time, but again, we should be careful when defining the, the strategy uh, for you to not end up on the wrong end. So having really small shards, that's not recommended or having too many shards, that's also not recommended. So even though it does reduce time, responses of queries, you should be careful with this type of, um, of approach, okay? Last but not least, when Lucene combines compact segments, does this influence perform or block inserts? So I think Marius can answer in more detail there, but what I can say is that, of course, it will consume uh, partially some of the, the resources when you're doing that. However, it does not entirely block the inserts, but I think maybe Marius or Marius, yeah. they can add more details there. Yes, that's true. Yeah, of course, it um, consumes uh, resources of the system when it's doing that, but uh, it doesn't affect at all in terms of blocking any more inserts or updates because the Lucene concept is that every new record or update or a delete uh, creates new segment. So the previous segments uh, are not affected when doing these operations. After this inserts and updates, another segment merge will take place maybe to yet do more merging, but doesn't block anything. Yeah, great. 
Thank you.